Good morning, church. Uh, that's a little bit better, a little bit better. Hey, we're glad you're here today. I'm glad you could see me, and uh, I hope that you are enjoying this blessed day. That's just something about Easter. In fact, you know, we're told that Easter is the most worshipped Sunday uh, throughout the year. And so there's something about this story that draws people. Uh, and I'm thankful that it does because it's basically the foundation of why we exist today. You know, as the early Christians would walk by each other, they would say, he's risen. And someone would answer, indeed. So let's try that. I'm going to say, he's risen. And I want you all to say, indeed. Okay, you ready? He's risen. Yes, indeed. I want to give you some real news this morning. Uh, Easter has not been canceled. Uh, you can't cancel Easter. Uh, buildings are closed without people being in them. Those buildings carry names of uh, denominations and religions. But I want you to know that the church is alive and well. Church is still open. Church has never stopped being open. In fact, you in your homes this morning, even though you couldn't invite your neighbors to come in and be with you, this is basically where the church began, in the homes. And I'm looking at when this, this is over and whatever we're going to go through to uh, get this thing going, whatever that is, I, I'm, re I'm just really praying for a fresh spirit and a fresh wind and fire from the body of Christ as we come out of our houses and we share that good news uh, and we reach out to people who may be walking in fear. I was talking this week to some of our friends that we support uh, over in Egypt and in our children's home in Tanzania. Their work is going on. It's not stopped. In fact, their work has escalated. So the church is moving on. They're still in business. I hope this morning as our praise team led you in worship that, that you were singing along with them. And uh, for me, the safest place to sing would have been right by myself. But it's that time that we can sing. And, and uh, just singing the songs of praise will lift those spirits. And we're going to, we're going to hear the word of God today. It never gets old. We're to walk in a sense of trust. You know, God challenged his people in Malachi. It was during a period of silence. After this, after God directed Malachi to write this, he was silent for 450 years. But God left these words to him. Test me, try me, see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you that will be running over. God is faithful even in these times. And I, I invite you to be faithful. The ministries continue. Our partners are still working. We're going to come out of this. There's going to be needs in our community. So I want you to, to say to you, continue to be faithful. Thank you for those that come by the church, those that use online giving, our mail. Uh, we're getting a lot of mail. So I'm thankful for that. Because, you know, guys, we're just beginning for whatever the next phase is. And I'm excited because I believe God is going to begin to do some great things in this earth because I really believe he's got our attention. Pray with me and we'll get into our message. Lord, thank you for this blessed Sunday. You have risen indeed. And Lord, you are enthroned. And Lord, it makes us feel comforted when we know that you are forever making intercession for us. Lord, today I want to lift our president. Father, on this man's shoulders faces decisions, God, that, that boggle the mind. How does he continue to walk us through? And how does he bring us out? Lord, I pray that he would hear your voice like never before. I pray that as he 
as he leads. I pray, dear God, that the clattering would stop, and that, Lord, we would see a uniting of hearts and minds looking towards people. Because, Lord, that's what government is for, is for the protection of your people. So I pray for President Trump this morning. Bless him. Give him the voices in his ear. And I thank you for a president that was televised this week just simply talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank God that you have placed him in this place of authority. Now, Lord, gather our hearts and minds together as we open your word. Lord, I'm this morning simply a fountain. Cleanse me and, Lord, flow through me the words of life. For, Lord, your words have life. Your words make us thirsty. And when we drink, oh, God, it satisfies for the satisfaction that causes us to come again and again to your word. So tabernacle alone among us. Bless your name in Jesus' name. Amen. What are your thoughts at Easter? You know, as a pastor over the years, there are times of the years that we bring messages. The, the birth of Christ uh, is, is, is a message within itself. And of course, the, the week, the life of Christ, the last week on earth, and then this Sunday of resurrection. There's so many scenes that are there. And this week, it just seemed like I went through the Gospels looking at the scenes. You know, you could talk about the Jewish leaders. Once Pilate turned him, Jesus, over to be crucified, and once he was on that cross, they were delighted. They felt like everything that they wanted had come to pass. They were a nitpicky people because Pilate, uh, I think it was Pilate getting back at them, wrote on that cross, Jesus, King of the Jews. And they wanted that taken down. Pilate didn't take it down, but, he, but Christ was crucified. So I think they went back to their homes, huddled and happy, planning how they could cover over the story that had went out. I thought about the disciples. When Christ was crucified, the disciples were scattered. We don't know where they went. We just know that they scattered, probably into their homes with closed doors. I think about Pilate. He was a troubled man. He, he really, and, and he said, I could find no fault in this man. But yet, it was his choice, his decision to offer Christ up. In fact, he offered the crowd a choice, Barabbas or Christ. And the crowd chose Christ. Pilate tried to do what many of us try to do. He tried to wash away the blood off of his hands, the guilt. And so he called for a pan of water and he, so he washed his hands. He simply told those, his blood is not on me. But you know, the blood of Jesus that was shed was shed for the world. So, in a way, our sins is what crucified Christ, and Pilate couldn't wash it away. What about the women? I love the story of the women. In fact, I'm kind of looking at a, at a story right now uh, over in Matthew. Listen to this. In Matthew, the 27th chapter, Right after the centurion, the man that was in charge of this crucifixion, when Jesus died, he made this statement, surely he was the son of God. That's a great story, the story of how this hardened soldier in charge of actually having the nails driven into Christ's hands confessed, yes, this had to be the son of God. But it says this, there were many women there at a distance at the cross who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him 
among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mom, mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee, which is Salome. Notice, they're at the cross, the women, the disciples hiding, the Pharisees in glee, Pilate troubled, the centurion with truth in his heart. That was Friday. Sunday came. When Sunday came, what did we see? Well, we saw Mary and the ladies at the tomb. They had followed Joseph of Arimathea to see the place where Jesus was buried. No doubt they wanted to come back the next day and anoint the body properly for burial. But when they got there, the stones was gone and there was no body to, to dress for burial because our Savior had rose from the dead. How about Peter and John? I, I love thinking about their foot race. Two, two guys, uh, the angel has said to the women, go tell us disciples that I'm risen. Tell them to meet me in Galilee where I told them that I would be. Peter and John got in a foot race. John beat Peter to the tomb, but Peter, as always, went all the way into the tomb. This is the story of the foot race. Two guys in hiding when great news brought them running. What about the guards that they posted? See, they put a large stone in front of that grave, and they actually put the king's seal on it so that if anyone had opened that tomb, uh, it would, they would know that the tomb had been opened that way. In fact, during this time, there's what's called the Nazarene text. And on it, around the same time of Jesus' death, there was a decree that went out that said no one under the, the threat of jail can open the grave of someone who is dead. Now, they don't know if that, that little text, that stone that they found was a result of Christ's death. Nevertheless, it was written, the guards who were under a death sentence, if they went by the law of that day for failing in their duties, they ran away afraid. What, what would you do if you're lounging in front of a grave and all of a sudden that stone rolled back and there was an exit. Well, they exited where they were sitting and they run and told the high priest, which brings us down to the Jewish leaders. What did they do with this resurrection? Well, they bribed the soldiers, gave them money and told them to tell this story. The disciples came and took his body the great cover-up was beginning. I think about Pilate again. I wonder what Pilate was thinking about when he got news that the grave was empty and Christ was not there. I'm wondering, would he be even more troubled? Would he feel some type of vindication or would he believe the message that stood before him? And when he said, you say, it is said that you are the king of the Jews. Are you? And Jesus told Pilate to answer that question. Well, there's also one other story. And that is about a church, the body of Christ, that had not yet come together. What did the body of Christ, the early church and the churches that follow them, what did they get from this resurrection? Well, they, they got a message. They got a message that has since then been proclaimed all over the world. The apostle Paul in one of his letters to the Corinthian church said this, 
Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. Gospel, good news. Jesus rose from the dead. Good news. Our sins have been paid for on the cross. The good news. Peter said, I want to remind, or Paul said, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, that you received in which you stand and by which you are being saved, which simply means that there is this point in time in our life that Christ will utter, utter that call through that, that voice that speaks into our life. It convicts us of sin. It humbles us. It leads us to repentance. And asking God to have mercy and save our souls. It comes at that time we're saved. There is that time that we live in this world, walking in this new life in which we live. It's called sanctification. And that just simply means learning how to become who you are in Christ. And so in that instance, we are being saved. Then one day we will either die or the Lord will come. And we'll stand before him and we will be at that time saved. So there's that time that we come to Christ, that time that we're in that process uh, bearing uh, the image of Jesus Christ. And in that time when we stand victorious in heaven forever with our Savior. He said, if you hold fast the word I preach to you. Now here's what he said I delivered to you that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried. Now, if you were watching Friday night, that's where I stopped in reading this verse. This morning, I'll finish it. And he was raised on the third day according to scriptures. The message of the church is the proclamation that a debt that is owed by every person to God has been paid for. The only way it could be covered. We had the Old Testament and her sacrifices. They were simply a shadow of the Christ who would come. And the only person, the only thing that could really stand between mankind and the wrath of God is the blood that Jesus shed. Now, when we talk about that, it's hard for us to say, hey, I'm guilty of something. We live in a time when the natural inclination is to blame someone else. If they hadn't have done this, I wouldn't have done this. Or to blame a habit that we have that we, that has a hold of it. We just habitually do it. We, we blame everything, but we forget that these same scriptures that proclaim the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that proclaim that by the grace of God, through his blood, we can experience eternal life, that same scripture says we all have sinned. There's not a person apart from Christ, born in this earth that did not carry that sin into life. Now you say, what do you mean by that? Well, the sin, as it's spoke about in the Bible, S-I-N, plural, is the rejection of Jesus Christ and his offer of salvation. That is the sin that Jesus paid for on the cross, that rejection, so that because of the, his death, man has an entrance to God by crying out, by confessing, repenting, receiving. I've often saw this picture. It pictures two cliffs that come together like this, and right in the middle is the cross that reaches out by which man can come from who he is across the divide into the presence of God. And it's that rejection. Now, rejection of God leads to sins. It leads to the things that we do, the sinful things, the habits we're drawn into, the things we find pleasure in, the things that we put 
in place of God. Those are sins that are committed and those have been forgiven, but the sin that God placed Christ on the cross for was the rejection of him, which opened the way for us to have life and have it eternal. The Apostle Paul kind of gave in the book of Romans a step through, and I, and I love this. It comes from the sixth chapter of Romans. Beginning in verse 1, Paul had just written that, that where sin abounds in the world, grace does more so abound. In, in other words, it's like this. I imagine uh, the demons of hell and Satan, when, when they heard that jubilation of Christ is risen, they had a sinking feeling, but they soon recovered because they had failed with Christ. Now their attention turned to his creation to make sure that we had smoke screens, we had obstacles, grabbing this, our, our fleshly, the, the things that we like as, as a person that takes us out of the presence of God, that comes in between us. That's where he began to work. And as we look at this nation, we could say that sin has abounded not only here, but sin has abounded all over the world. But the assurance is where sin goes, grace does much more. Grace, grace, marvelous grace. Paul said then, okay, if grace, there's so much of this grace, shall we continue to sin? That's kind of like a rhetorical question. <laughs> but Paul answers the question by saying, by no means. And he gives this, how can we who have died to sin still live in it. That speaks directly into the heart of, of believers. It speaks to the heart of those who are confessors that they believe in God, are confessors that they believe in the work of the church, the good the church does, but they have never ever experienced identifying with that death. What does that look like? Well, Paul gave an example. He said, I am crucified with Christ. And being crucified with Christ, it's no longer I, this flesh that lives, but it is Christ who lives in me. You see, the new birth, as it's called, carries with it characteristics. And that characteristic is a turning away from the life that you had lived. Turning away and walking in a way that you had never gone before, trusting the Savior. As I talk to people many, many times, their response to me is what they will give up. The things that they can't do are are the things that they will have to do. And they don't realize, don't really take an honest look. When I think of my life, I can honestly say that when Christ came into my life, I lost everything in my life. By that I mean everything that I got up in the morning to think about doing, the pleasures that I did, the way I lived life, the way I thought, the way I looked at the world. It was completely different and it was it was kind of shaky because I didn't think the same way. There was, there was something in me that kind of showed me the life that I lived and just how good it was, what it had done for me. You know, if we really take stock of our lives, sometimes the things that we hold dearest to argue, us, argue loudest for are the things that really and truly put us into a bondage, a bondage we really can't break out of. Habits, mind, thoughts, ways, we're held there. 
But when Christ came out of the grave, the chains of sin were broken. It's like when Paul and Silas was in jail. Midnight, they're not crying or moaning, they're singing. Praises to God. All of a sudden, buildings shook and the doors flew open and the chains fell off of them. That's a beautiful picture of a new life in Jesus Christ. Chained, no longer pulled down. That's why Paul said, how can we who have died to sin continue to live in it? Well, Paul, help us out. Tell me, tell me what that looks like. Well, he says in verse 5, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Now, Jesus went into the grave, son of man, son of God. And he came out of the grave, son of God. You see, our whole life changes. And that identification of a resurrected life, Christ from that point, we're going to read in a minute, he died once, never to die again. And the promise that we have is when we identify, by that we identify with the fact that through our sins were placed on Christ on the cross. I know that's hard to fathom, but it's true. It's, it's something as you begin to say, yes, Lord, I believe, you don't figure out how that occurred. You just have a sense that it did occur. And so when we equate being a believer, we equate it with the fact that we have experienced his death. And in fact, the first thing that is done after a person comes to Christ is they are placed either in a baptismal or in the ocean as we have in the years past baptized in the Atlantic. And in that baptism, that baptism is not the washing away of sins. That baptism is an identification. We are saying that just as Christ was placed on the ground, I'm placed under the water and as I come out of that water and breathe that breath I come out in newness of life when we come to Christ we come one way when we come to Christ and walk further we're never the same and I can tell you this as a believer the things that once had our attention in life the things that we would fight and argue over to, in order to do them. They're just lifestyles that we live. Those are the very things that will begin to haunt you. It's called the conviction of the Spirit. I thought of this a while ago, and I know my preacher friends will probably text me or email me and say, man, that's a, that's a crazy illustration, but I'm going to use it anyhow. You know, when you're a little young, you're young and you get a bicycle, you get training wheels. And they put them on there so you won't fall off that bike, bust your head open or get hurt. I, I bought my great-grandson a, a bicycle and it had, I made sure it had good sturdy training wheels. I thought about sanctification. Growing to become that new creature and creation in Christ. Identifying with Christ's death and moving forward in a new life that I don't really know how God is going to use me. It's kind of like riding a bike with training wheels. The training wheels, I named one the Word of God and the other one the Holy Spirit. And the thing is, in life, you get a little older and you can handle the bicycle. Our life here on this lot world is going to be spent with those two training wheels because it is the Word of God and the Spirit of God that lives in us, either by convicting us 
The Bible talks about either leading us by a hook in our nose or a bridle in our mouth, leading us in the ways of the Lord. The Word reveals God more fully. The, re the Word of God reveals the life that we have in Christ. The Spirit of God there is to guide us. That, he's that buffer so that we can say with the psalmist, when I fall, I don't fall face forward. Because you see, in this life, there will be times that you fail. And it is that time the comforter will lead you to the only place that can bring that true forgiveness that gives us peace in the middle of the storm when he leads us to Christ. Once again, just simply say, Lord, I failed you. Forgive me. Help me to continue my walk. And it's back on the bicycle going through life. That resurrection into new life, one day we'll go through if the Lord delays his coming. We'll all face it. We'll face death. Death is another type of baptism, you could say, because you're placed in the ground, or your body is. But something wonderful has happened before that body ever gets to the ground. The Spirit of God arises with you. And the war, Scriptures tell us that in that, that death, the sleep of death, our eyes are awakened to the reality and to the presence of Christ. And where He is, we dwell and we wait for his final return that's coming one day when he will begin all over again in the new heavens and the new earth. So we identify, and that baptism that we take is this, it's a witness. I have been crucified. I am buried. I am resurrected to walk in newness of life. Paul said that we know that our old self, crucified, killed with him in order that the body of sin may be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who has died has been set free from sin. Friends, that doesn't mean that now you live in perfect imperfection. It doesn't happen in this world. This walk of the new man being that inner man, the old man, which is the one that has been with us. And it's a battle that Christ plainly says we win. Because we have the same power in us that powered Jesus out of that grave. We have the presence of a risen Lord living in us. We have the presence of the Spirit of God living in us. And so it puts power to our no. I don't know about you, but I, I look back over the years and there were times that I would think, you know, I really need to change some things. I probably got some encouragement <laughs> from my wife. And I'd say, you know, I'm going to do this differently. I'm not going to do that anymore. And there was always a time that I could, I could do that. But then there was always that time that I seemed to just fall right back where I was. It wasn't that I didn't want to make my wife happy. It simply was, before Christ, there was something absent from my wanting to change anything. Because the old self will always be happy with who it is. Why? Because it feeds on what you give it. My cat Sophie, she's a happy cat. Every time I rattle a little food, and put it in her bowl. Why? Because that's what she likes. 
plus he's happy. The thing, thing in our life before Christ, we were really happy. And the only time we ever really decided that we wanted to change that life is when that life got us in trouble. Uh, maybe you saw some blue lights or maybe your family began to break down. Maybe you had trouble with children or something, a financial breakdown, all the things that suffered in this world. And at that time, all of a sudden, we began to think, if I could just do different, things would be okay. But you see, there's only one place that you're going to be okay. And that's in a relationship with Jesus Christ and Him being the power of your life. Because you see, Christians, non-Christians, every other false religion in the world, everybody's going through this pandemic right now. We're all in homes, regardless of race, creed, culture, or place of existence. The difference is this. In the life of a Christian, he has given us this blessing of being able to see things through the eyes of God. Now, that doesn't mean seeing the end of things or why these things happen, but seeing through the eyes of faith that God is still sovereign. He's still on the throne. He's not given up control. And so we begin to have this sense that if God's not upset, and this didn't surprise God, then what I'm going to do is simply, in my home, I'll just simply walk by faith. And there will be something in you that gives you this sense that we don't know how it's going to be, but it'll be okay because God is going to bring glory through this thing. God is going to bring magnify him. So, because, see, everything that we have put our faith in, I mean, the stock market that everybody's just been raving about and our economy being so good, it crashed. Everything that we, the idols that we put before God, all of these things have crashed. But there's only one thing that has not crashed, folks. God is still on his throne directing the events of this world. And of that, we can be steadfast and sure. I keep seeing posts on Facebook and I hear people saying, in fact, sometimes I almost slip up and say it myself, when things get back to normal, let me ask you a question. Viewing the state of this world, the state of our nation, do you want things back to normal? I don't really think I do. Because that is a new normal, apart from the normal that God brought into this world. So we don't know what it's going to look like. I tell people all the time, well, I don't know. Pastor, uh, do you still thinking about summer splash? Are you still thinking about those fall trips? Yes, those are in the plans. God will direct those. We don't know what this world is going to look for, but I am praying that this world will experience something that, you know, for a while in our history, there was this time called the Dark Ages. And it was dark for a number of reasons, but out of the dark ages, simmering in the life of a monk was a turning point for a man and a unit called the church. It was the clarification of Scripture, real Scripture, not dogma, real Scripture. And it's called a Reformation movement because it reformed, and out of that, churches began to spring up whose only message was this message. 
the message of Easter. Jesus Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again. And so out of those dark ages, this new reality came. The people began to be able to hold the word of God in their hands instead of relying on people to tell them what the word of God says. Well, I'm praying for a, another breakout. I'm praying that as our churches are in their homes right now, wanting to get out for any reason, people who have never wanted to jog right now will go out of their house and jog for a little while just to get out of the house. But I'm praying that our church, the people, the body of Christ, will come out of those houses with a renewed belief, a renewed strength, and a renewed, a renewed look at this world. And the, the fact that we have preached and talked about the return of Christ for a long time until we kind of temper it down. But you realize that Jesus, as Jesus came, and just as he died, resurrected, and went away again, he's coming back, and then when he comes back, that's it. There is no more returning to anything. It's over. It's finished. And so the thing that should drive us are people still in bondage, people who now maybe have been awakened to the fact that there is a need in their life and their need goes beyond toilet paper or sanitary things and the, the, the things that were flying off the shelf. There's a need greater than that. There's a need for a peace in the storm. And the name of that peace in the storm is Jesus Christ our Lord. And so Paul speaks to the body of Christ and he said, for the one who has died has been set free from sin. Power of the word, the power of the spirit puts the power in your no. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. That's the life that we live. As we identify with his death and his burial and his resurrection, the life that we live is really no longer yours. It's been bought. It's been paid for by the precious, most precious commodity that could ever pay a debt that you owed. The life of Christ. And so the life that we live, we just give ownership back to who created us, our God. And our God will guide us in this life. He'll strengthen us. He'll keep us out of the bushes and the ditches that we sometimes fall into. And when we stray from him, he's always going to be in the road waiting for your return. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God and Christ. This is not a pep speech or a pep up sentence. This is something that has substance to it. When we begin to consider, that means to, to realize who you are. You're a person. You're a person who Christ has saved, who has redeemed your life. When you begin to realize that, our lives will then be a life that we live for God. Now, you know, a lot of people said, well, what does that mean? I, 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 I'm a dentist. Uh, you know, I work for a construction company. I sell insurance. I work in a bank. Uh, I'm a homemaker. Uh, what does that mean? My life, do I have to? No. God just simply places points of light 
in places of darkness. And if believers would just simply begin to realize that wherever you are, Jesus has placed a point of light. Because no doubt where you are, not everyone is a believer. They don't know what a believer really looks like or what they're supposed to act. They just, they just see the, the side that is presented. But you're a point of light to show people what real light is. And it's not your own light. No, it's the light of Christ that is reflected in our life because he is the true light. Paul goes on. He said, listen, consider yourself dead to Christ, dead to sin, alive in Christ. The life that you now live, you live for the Lord. He said, because of this power, do not let sin reign. To reign simply means rule, have dominion, have you in this grasp. Don't let it. Why? Because we have already been told that we have been freed from that bondage. So it would be like a person who had been sentenced to jail, and all of a sudden he has been given a pardon, and he walks out of this jail. Maybe let's liken it to being in solitary confinement. And he walks out of this jail, a free person, and he walks around for a while, and he decides, you know what? I kind of like it back here in the darkness. I like it back in my cell. Don't let sin back on the throne of your life. Understand yourself to be free. And that which threatens you no longer has dominion over you. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life as and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. When I read that, I think right back to the prayer that most everyone knows. We call it the Lord's Prayer. It was simply a a model prayer. Jesus said, pray like this. There's two clauses in there. One of them says, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. I think the lesson is this. You can't ask God to deliver you from temptation and to keep you from evil if you put yourself where the temptation is and you place yourself where the evil is. And I speak of the old life that you used to live. Don't look at it as a fond memory. Look at it in the reality that there was a point in place in your life that you realized that life was leading you in a wrong direction. And you turned and you began to follow Christ. Don't pray, lead us not into temptation and put yourself in places where you'll be tempted. It's an old story, but it has so much truth to it. There was a man who was a town drunk. He lived out of town and every Friday he would come into town and he would hit his two favorite bars you know, they would, he would drink till he passed out, and they would take him home. He'd be back on Saturday. That happened week after week after week after week. And one day, he went to uh, a meeting, and he heard about Christ. And he gave his heart. He said, I've just given my heart to Christ. I'm going to follow him. The next Friday night, people were waiting for him, and when he came into town, he walked on the opposite end of the street, did what business he had to do, and go home. And he did that for a while. And he began to think of himself, I got this. I go into town on Friday and Saturday. I've got this. And so he said, I'm going to test myself. 
So the next Friday, when he went into town, he walked on the side of the streets where his two favorite bars were. And he turned around and went home. Oh, he was filled up with pride then. I've got this. I've got this. I, I have done this. And so the next week he walked in, same side of the street, went in and out. The following week he said, I'm going to show myself how strong I am. I'm going to go into my favorite bars and drink a Coke with my buddies. And so he did that. The next week when he came into town, he walked in. And he began to drink with his buddies all over again. And they carried him home. Why do I give you that illustration? Apart from Christ, we don't have the power to save ourselves. The great enemy of God is an enemy of humanity. If you look at the graves because of Satan's hatred for this world, the tricks that he has played and lies, the lies that he has told. He hates God. He couldn't touch Christ. So he comes after his creation. You know, the story of Easter is a story of our Savior's death on the cross to pay a debt we never could pay. by living a life that we could not live, by experiencing what man has feared, death. But through Christ, we found out in Christ that's not a final reality because as Christ was raised from the dead and we identify with that death, burial, and resurrection, we'll walk in the eternal life even on this earth. I say that simply because we'll live on. Once we pass through death's door, we live on for an eternity. The flip side of that is to continue to reject the offer of salvation. You too are going to experience death's door. Except for an eternity, you'll not be in the presence of God You'll simply have a full, real knowledge. There was a God. There was a Christ. He did pay your sin debt. He did die on the cross. He was resurrected. But you're going to spend eternity in a place called hell and the torment that will bring from it. The offer of Easter is life. Life through Jesus Christ. The offer of Easter is power. Power to live that life. The offer of Egypt is of Easter is a direction in your life that is to live to God. These are the things that man searches for in life direction and a purpose in life. Only through the cross does Jesus give you that true life, that true purpose. I'm going to take just a minute. I want you to think about what the word has said today. The last part I'll read, for sin will no longer have dominion over you since you're not under law but under grace. I think Paul explains back into chapter 5, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Think about your life, really. If you've been cooped up in your home, you really haven't had a lot of distractions in your life. I want you to think about the most important question you can ever answer. I'm not talking about what religious beliefs you have, what church you go to. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about do you really have a relationship 
with a risen Savior. Have you got to that point where you're sick and tired of being sick and tired of your life? You realize there are things that you just like to get rid of them because they're there and they keep mounting up. When we turn to Christ and at his offer, we say, oh God, have mercy on me a sinner. I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you paid not just the sins of the world, you paid for my sins. Father, I receive you. I receive this salvation. I give you my life. If you've never done that, now would be a really good time when there's going to be so much uncertainty. Remember, we're not going back. We're, we're going forward in some way. And have someone to walk with you and guide you in life. You know, you can go online right now and text Jerry and you can tell him about your decision. You can ask that we, one of our staff, contact you or ask for prayer. We want to walk with you. We want to be there for you. Christian friend, are you using this time for what you've said you always wanted to do? Spend more time in the Word. You got the time. Are you being fortified? Are you ready to come out of your house to go back into the street with the good news? Jesus is alive. Father, your word is living, it's active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord you, Lord, you said that your word goes down through the muscle of fat, even into the bone, into the marrow of our being. Lord, release that power today, I pray. And those that you call to Christ, Lord, this, this morning simply cry out to you their needs. And Lord, grant them <clears throat> that assurance that as they identify with you, you identify with them. Oh God, we pray that many will come to believe this day and let it be a resurrection Sunday in their life. For every Christian, Lord, is listening, let this simply be a time, Lord, that when we become fortified with your word and through prayer learn how to communicate with you, not only to ask but to listen and to receive. Lord, redeem your time as we go through this time. Because, Lord, all of our eyes on you. And I pray that you will be glorified. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. God bless you. I love you.